Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease at the University Feinberg School of Medicine. We have heard through the years from you how important it is to stay active and healthy. So we are super excited that you will learn how lifestyle factors can influence the health of your brain and how important it is to you to learn strategies for wellness as you age. Today, Dr. Maureen will cover topics such as sleep, exercise, nutrition, social relationships, mental alertness, and stress management. There will also be plenty of time to ask questions and equally important, you will hear about all the wonderful ways in which you can become, become involved in a variety of research topics. So without further ado, I present to you Dr. Maureen Daly. Thank you so much, Robin, for that introduction and for inviting me to give this presentation. I'm going to share my screen here to get started. Okay. All right, so um, good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm incredibly excited um, to talk to you about lifestyle habits and strategies to support brain health. Um, so as a clinical neuropsychologist, um, I'm very fortunate to meet and work with a lot of different people to help them and their families and doctors better understand any changes in thinking that people may experience you know, as they age. Um, now, my goal is really to understand people's own strengths and weaknesses and to come up with suggestions that may be most helpful in supporting them in their day-to-day -day life. Um, let's see here. Um, and, and so um, you know, we'll be talking about a lot of different kinds of tips. And again, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type them in the chat box or you can write them down and we'll address them you know, at the end of the presentation. All right, so the goals of the presentation today are you know, to define some key terms, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and then I'll be identifying the lifestyle factors and behaviors. And with each um, you know, factor and behavior that I discuss, I'll be you know, providing some tips for making some healthy changes. Okay, so in terms of the key, the key uh, terms that I want to address today, um, cognition refers to brain-based skills that are required to process information, learn, and problem solve. So some examples of cognition include things like attention, memory, language, uh, visual spatial abilities, planning, organizing, just all different aspects of thinking. Now, brain health is based on the premise that our minds, bodies, behaviors, and environment are all interrelated. So even if we aren't aware of it, our brains can change and reorganize in terms of structure, function, and connections. Um, and this is called neuroplasticity. So when we maintain good brain health, then we are functioning at our highest potential in daily life. Now, lifestyle factors and behaviors are um, is based on the fact that you know the ways in which we live and behave can impact our brains throughout our lifespan. So there are certainly factors that you know are out of our own control that impact brain health, like our genetics and aspects of our environment. Um, but there are these factors and behaviors that have been shown um, to help you know support you know good brain health as we age. So by maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Uh, we can optimize the resources for our brains to get the most out of neuroplasticity. And healthy living skills are what I really like to focus on today. So those are the real world tools and strategies to support brain health. And I'm hoping that I can convince you today that it's never too late to learn new ways to preserve and promote brain health. Um, now there was a paper that was published uh, this past year that identified you know, 12 different modifiable risk factors um, that account for around 40% of worldwide dementias, which could theoretically be prevented or delayed. So I don't have time to review all of those factors today, um, but I'll be presenting information and tips for some, several of them and some that I think that'll be most relevant, okay? All right. So we'll 
move right into the different factors. So physical activity is where we'll begin. Um, so exercise is medicine. The heart and the brain are interrelated. So what you do to protect your heart can also help your brain to function at its best. Uh, when you exercise, oxygen is pumped throughout the body and this helps the brain's veins, arteries and capillaries stay healthy and clear of buildup. Um, so physical activity also nourishes cells and creates the right environment for your brain to thrive, including growth of new nerve cells and connections. And research has also demonstrated a protective effect of exercise against cognitive decline, per, uh, particularly exercise in midlife. Um, it can also improve you know, your balance, uh, reduce risk of falls, and have a positive impact on mental health uh, by stimulating release of various neurochemicals and hormones that help to relieve stress and improve mood. Now, the current recommendation is 150 minutes a week. So you know, that could be 30 minutes five days a week, or you could have longer periods of exercise less frequently, but that is the current recommendation. So some tips for increasing physical activity. Uh, the first thing is do something that you like. You know, I often talk to people about this. If, um, if you don't enjoy it, chances are you're not going to stick with it, okay? So choose something that you enjoy and that feels good for you and your body. Um, so this could be cardio, like brisk walking, um, you know, swimming, bike riding. Um, it could be something like strength training, like lift, light, light weight lifting, or you know, some kinds of resistance training, or it could be stretching, you know, for example, with yoga. Um, certainly pace yourself. So start out gradually and build up over time um, and take breaks. So trying to do too much at once um, can just end up making us feel overwhelmed and lose motivation. So if you've been inactive for a long time, getting moving can be difficult. And so you know, I just intend to encourage people to start slow and be kind to yourself, you know, as you sort of ramp up to the, you know, recommended, you know, amount of exercise. Um, and get support. Um, you know, sometimes um, having somebody join you or even just encourage you and hold you accountable to re reach your goals for physical activity can be really helpful. Um, it can also be helpful to have somebody um, you know, give you the time in order to do the physical activity. So taking a break so that you can, you know, do whatever exercise it is that you enjoy. Um, then problem solving. So certainly things can get in the way. Um, our schedules, bad weather, we're in Chicago, this happens. Um, of course, now there's a pandemic as well. So things are shut down. So it can be really hard and it can feel like it's like your options are, are limited. So just try to think about, you know, ways in which you can incorporate physical activity into your daily life, whether that's, you know, taking stairs more frequently, um, you know, doing stretches at home during different commercial breaks, um, using things around the house to do lightweight, you know, like, you know, cans of, of soup or beans or something is, is something that can also help you just incorporate exercise, you know, um, without a whole lot of change to your day-to-day -day routine. And then talk to your doctor. So absolutely, if you have any, you know, limiting conditions or pain, talk to your doctor about what kinds of exercises may be most beneficial for you. Okay, so the next factor I'd like to talk about is cognitive and mental activity. Okay, so um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, cognition involves a lot of different aspects of our thinking. Um, and these, I have some of them listed here. So learning and memory is, you know, just being able to take in and, and store information for later. Um, attention and processing speed, um, you know, certainly the ability to focus and quickly take in new information is really important in being able, you know, to learn. Um, reasoning and problem solving, you know, include things like planning, organizing information, to make decisions and you know responding to unexpected events and being able to you know think flexibly. Um, language skills, you know, could be reading, writing, or if you um, sign, you know, any kind of aspects of language. Then visual, spatial, and perceptual skills refers to you know the ability to identify visual information, where it is in space, and to accurately interpret or perceive visual and spatial information. 
So you can see in this picture here that different parts of the brain are associated with different aspects of cognition. Um, and you know, certainly complex tasks incorporate lots of different areas of the brain. Um, and you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, we recognize that everybody has their own you know, pattern of cognitive strengths and weaknesses. And you know, the goal is to really use our strengths to support or compensate you know, for weaknesses, whether they change over time or you know, are relatively stable. So in terms of you know, building cognitive reserve, so first let me tell you what I mean by, by cognitive reserve. So this refers to you know, the mental resources that are available to a person to adapt and find you know, alternate ways of getting a job done, okay? So it's sort of the, the mental capacity that you have in engaging in you know, just your day-to-day -day activities. So research suggests you know, that people who keep learning and challenge, learning new and challenging things um, may be at lower risk for cognitive decline as they age. Um, so much like learning um, a new physical activity or a sport exercises your physical muscles in new ways, learning a new skill or revisiting an old one um, exercises the mind in new ways. So it helps to you know, make new connections in the brain um, and allow for you know, more you know, parts of the brain or networks in the brain to communicate with each other. Um, so research suggests that when it comes to cognitive reserve, um, you use it or lose it, okay? So listed here are just a few ideas um, you know, for ways to build cognitive reserve or to keep your mind you know, active as you age. So for example, this could be, you know, watching documentaries, you know, for example, on like PBS or the History Channel, um, you know, the library also, you know, is a good source of information to borrow, you know, movies. Um, enrolling in courses, whether that's through, you know, a community college or online, um, learning a musical instrument, attending lectures, just like the one today, um, you know, through different community organizations or libraries learning a new craft, art, or hobby, um, doing different kinds of puzzles like crosswords, Sudoku, or other things can also be really, you know, um, a, a good mental challenge. Uh, challenging friends to games. So, for example, Scrabble or card games, board games, um, you know, those can be enjoyable just to socialize with friends, but then also, you know, again, sort of learning and strengthening different skills and playing memory games. So if you have you know, any little family members or neighbors around, those um, little ones can be excellent sources of competition when it comes to your memory. So you know, that all being said, there is no specific game or activity that has been shown to prevent or slow a decline in thinking or onset of dementia. Um, but what seems to be uh, most beneficial is again, doing new things, you know, trying different things, and again, doing something that you enjoy. Okay, so the next one is sleep. Now this is a big one. Um, restful, restorative sleep is essential to the ability to think clearly during the daytime. Um, so getting enough quality sleep protects our mental health, physical health, quality of life and safety. Um, now there's this you know, quote from um, an opinion um, article that was written in the New York Times a few years ago that I think is helpful in sort of understanding you know, what's going on when we sleep. So as your body sleeps, you know, your brain is quite actively playing the part of mental janitor. It's clearing out all of the junk that has accumulated as a result of your daily thinking. When our sleep is disturbed, whatever the cause, our cleaning system breaks down, okay? So essentially the, the sort of junk you know, from the day builds up over time. Um, so sleep, you know, when it's when it's good, you know, it, it helps your brain work properly. So it improves learning, helps you pay attention, make decisions, and be creative. Uh, on the flip side of that, you know, problems with sleep also impact you know brain activity. So you can have trouble making decisions, solving problems, controlling emotions and behavior, and trouble coping with changes, you know, in the environment. And uh, you know, chronic poor sleep has also been associated with depression, suicide, and risk-taking behaviors. So it's really not to be underestimated. Um, people over age 65 need about the same amount of sleep as all adults, which is seven to nine hours each night. Um, 
now with age, it may be harder to fall and harder to fall asleep and stay asleep. Um, and there may be longer periods of lighter sleep. Um, so more easily disrupted and shorter periods of deep sleep. Um, so we can, there are ways in which we can promote uh, restorative sleep by creating, you know, a comfortable sleep environment and practicing healthy sleep behaviors. We, we often refer to this as sleep hygiene. So it's getting into really good, you know, habits to support good sleep. Um, now sleep problems aren't created in a day. And so we don't expect them to go away in a day. You know, this is you know, something that you have to work on over time. But these tips can help if you, you know, use them consistently. So I'm just going to go through each of these in a little bit more detail. So the first one is stick to the same wake up time every day. Um, so by waking up at about the same time every day, this helps you become tired at about the same time every night. And allows you to make sure that you get the sleep that you need. Next one is minimize napping. Um, so tr if you if you are somebody who naps and feels like it's really helpful for you, just try to limit your naps, you know, to 20 minutes or less. Um, you know, the issue with longer naps or naps that occur later in the day is that it essentially decreases your body's drive for sleep, you know, later in the day um, when you actually really need, you know, more sleep overnight. The next one is taking care of your body. So um, making sure that you're taking your medications, you know, as they're prescribed and at the times that they're prescribed is really important. Um, and if you have medical conditions or you experience pain that interferes with your sleep, certainly, you know, talking to your doctor and addressing those conditions um, is important. Um, exercise, you know, getting some exercise, you know, ideally at least two hours before bed. Um, so that it doesn't interfere again with your sleep drive. Um, getting exercise can help you to be tired, you know, at, by the end of the day so that you're able to sleep. Um, maintaining a regular bedtime routine. Okay, so this is, you know, preparing your body for sleep. So kind of doing the same order of things each night before you go to bed, things that are relaxing for you. Um, that might be reading, um, listening to relaxing music, taking a warm bath, um, is that when you follow the same pattern, you know, every night you're teaching your body that this is, you know, this is the time for me to get ready for bed. And this is now the time for me to go to sleep. Okay. So you're sort of cueing your body and teaching your body to prepare for sleep. You also want to make your bedroom as comfortable as possible in terms of, you know, the temperature, you know, and your, and your bedding itself. Um, so make sure that you're comfortable. And, um, you know, try to minimize, you know, noise that might disrupt your sleep. So, you know, I often can you know, recommend using a white noise machine or a fan um, or wearing earplugs so that you don't get disturbed, you know, throughout the night. Um, also limiting light sources. So, you know, one source of light is through your window. So using blackout curtains or dark curtains. And then another big one is minimizing screen time, you know, before bed. Um, the recommendation is at least a half an hour before bed, but ideally an hour before bed, you're not using devices, okay? So things like your cell phone, if you have a tablet or computer that you like to be on, you know, later in the day, really try to turn off, you know, devices at least, an hour, at least a half an hour, ideally an hour before bed. Um, and that also goes for TV. And so essentially it's the blue light from you know, these devices that interfere with our sleep-wake cycle. And so we just wanna minimize the impact of that. Um, now this next one seems counterintuitive, um, but I, it is an important one. So limit your time awake in bed. So if you're in bed for more than about 20 minutes or so, um, it's recommended to get out of bed you know, and do something relaxing. So that may be repeating part of your bedtime routine in order to relax your body again. Um, so essentially uh, the idea is that if you're laying in bed and your mind is just kind of going and you're thinking about, okay, what, ha what happened today, the day before, what's happening the next day. And, and you just kind of go through everything in your mind and your mind is, is racing while you're laying in bed. You're essentially teaching your body that when you're in bed, that's when you know your brain turns on and is thinking, and we actually want to teach it the opposite. And then certainly talk to your doctor if you're having trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or waking up too early. You know, let your doctor know. 
Also, if you snore or if you're told that you gasp for air, you know, throughout the night and you're really tired during the day, also bring this to your doctor's attention because these symptoms can be, um, you know, associated with sleep apnea, which is a treatable, you know, medical condition that's fairly common. Okay, so next is mood and stress management. Um, so I think we're all, you know, very familiar with this, you know, these days. Um, certainly some individuals may feel anxious and depressed. Um, depression is a common problem among older adults, but it is not considered a normal, you know, part of aging. So in fact, most studies actually um, indicate that older adults feel really satisfied with their lives despite illnesses or physical problems. Um, but there are you know, certainly life changes that occur more frequently as people get older that can contribute to feelings of you know, stress, uneasiness, and sadness. You know, for example, death of loved ones, um, you know, retirement, moving, um, dealing with serious illness or disability, all of these things can contribute to um, you know, feelings of you know, depression or anxiety. Um, now, in most studies, depression has been um, associated with an increased risk of dementia with greater frequency and severity of depressive episodes further increasing risk. And so, um, you know, if somebody's having, you know, symptoms of depression and anxiety, we certainly want to identify it and treat it, you know, as early as possible. Um, so symptoms of depression and anxiety can interfere with memory and other cognitive abilities. And some symptoms can include things like sadness, feeling really tired, um, trouble sleeping, feeling irritable, having problems focusing, and you know, nervousness, tenseness, or frequent worrying. Okay, and so treatments can include medication, um, either in combination with or independently of uh, therapy. And therapy, you know, is a great opportunity to learn techniques and strategies for managing stress um, and mood symptoms. Now, the tips that I'm going to talk about are more, you know, they are, are a little bit more for managing stress and, you know, reducing risk for um, depression and anxiety. But certainly if you're having, you know, symptoms of, you know, depression or anxiety that are interfering with your day-to-day -day life, then seeking professional help is really the best, you know, option. Um, now, in terms of managing stress, you know, especially given, you know, the events of this past year and the ongoing pandemic, we're all very aware, you know, that life brings a lot of challenges that can be incredibly stressful and overwhelming. Um, now these stress reduction techniques, you know, as I mentioned, you know, they're not a cure-all, but they can certainly have a positive impact on, you know, mood and cognition. So, um, you know, one thing would be staying in touch with family and other sources of support. So getting support from people who you really care about and who care about you. Um, exercising regularly, you know, I, I alluded to this earlier with, you know, the release of neurochemicals and hormones um, that occur during exercise. Those have a positive impact on mood. Um, engaging in pleasurable activities or hobbies, maintaining a consistent sleep routine, uh, minimizing substance use, uh, reducing your responsibilities if possible. So what I mean by this is that, um, you know, as people get older, you know, the high level of responsibility that you may have maintained, you know, when you were working full time, raising a family, it, it may not be as helpful, or it may not even be possible to maintain that same level of, you know, responsibility. So really, you know, thinking about, you know, the responsibilities that are essential for you, versus those that are enjoyable versus those that may be, you know, creating a lot of anxiety or stress. Um, you know, so for example, paying bills or managing finances um, may create a lot of stress for you, um, but it could be addressed by, you know, talking to a, you know, a family member or a close trusted friend about getting assistance in managing that. Um, and then certainly deep breathing and mindfulness exercises, you know, are also helpful. So mindfulness, um, you know, is a type of meditation practice where you really try to focus on being present in the moment um, and, you know, without interpreting or judging, you know, your thoughts or your feelings or, you know, your environment around you. Um, even a few minutes a day of, of practicing mindfulness uh, can help in um, 
in having positive impacts on sleep. It has, uh, it's been shown to reduce, you know, the negative uh, effects of heart disease and blood pressure. And, you know, some of the practices involve just sitting and focusing on your breath, which is nice because your breath is always with you. Um, and so it's always available to you. And then another one is what's referred to as guided imagery. So this may be, you know, visualizing yourself in a really safe and relaxing, you know, environment. Okay. Now the next factor that I wanna talk about is nutrition. Um, so eating balanced meals that include all the major food groups, eating regularly, making sure to drink lots of water, um, and eating foods within your medical restrictions. So for example, if you have diabetes or high blood pressure, you know, following the guidance of your medical providers. Um, these are all really important for making sure that the brain has the nourishment it needs to function properly. Um, so dietary patterns rather than specific foods, nutrients, and supplements may impact cognition and health outcomes in aging. Um, so again, much like I said with the exercise you know, piece earlier, research suggests that what's good for the heart is also good for the brain. So risk factors for cardiovascular disease like hypertension, diabetes, and obesity have been associated with cognitive decline and can contribute to you know, unhealthy changes in brain structure and function you know, with age and if they're not being sufficiently treated. Um, now the research has shown that people who followed, you know, certain diets, so one of them is the Mediterranean diet shown here in this pyramid, um, and another is, um, you know, the, called the mind diet, which is a combination of a Mediterranean diet and a diet that has been um, uh, tailored for individuals who are trying to lower their blood pressure. Um, and these diets, you know, have a lot of things in common in that, you know, they really are emphasizing um, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, you know, healthy fats, like, you know, using olive oils um, and other kinds of oils, um, plant-based proteins like beans and nuts and legumes, you know, these kinds of things should really be like the basis of, of our diet. And then um, having you know, less frequently eating things like red meat and sweets and other, um, you know, more refined grains or processed foods. Okay. Um, now this is uh, from the National Institute on Aging where they just provide some, you know, examples of ways in which you can shift your eating habits to be a little bit more healthy. Now, this is certainly not exclusive and you know you can you can sort of identify you know which of these may be most beneficial for you depending on what your current eating habits look like you know but just some examples including you know, instead of having you know a regular soda or a sweetened iced tea trying to shift to water or soda water that is flavored more naturally um, you know instead of the fruit products with added sugars trying to um, consume more fresh fruits or whole fruits. So again, these are just some examples, you know, of potentially, um, you know, helpful shifts that you can think about just in your day-to-day -day choices regarding your own nutrition. Okay, now the next factor that I wanna talk about is social support. Um, social support is often, you know, one of the first things we lose when we're dealing with chronic stress. Um, so feeling overwhelmed or consumed by daily stressors can cause us to withdraw from the important people in our lives. Um, but on the other hand, reaching out to social support can really help us be more resilient to stress. Um, research has demonstrated that social isolation, you know, is a risk factor for dementia. And there may be a lot of different reasons for this that aren't entirely clear at present, but um, social isolation has been demonstrated to increase the risk of, you know, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and depression. Um, and it may result in cognitive inactivity. So just being less mentally stimulated and active in daily life. Um, and linked with faster cognitive decline and low mood. Um, so there are a lot of different kinds of social support, um, you know, and so you can think about ways in which you can, you know, identify and, you know, either provide that social support for other loved ones in your life or seek that support from others for yourself. 
Um, so emotional support is, is probably what we think of, you know, most frequently when we talk about, you know, social support or, or just feeling supported is that it makes you feel understood and accepted no matter what you're feeling. And it, it's often expressed with, you know, kind words and gestures. Um, informational support is, you know, making, th making it possible for you to learn and find out new things. So knowing how to research a medication that you're interested in taking, um, and how to identify which community organizations to contact, you know, if you are looking for, you know, some classes or learning opportunities. Um, tangible support is, you know, is very practical kind of support, like getting a ride, you know, to run errands or go grocery shopping. Um, so thinking, do you have people you can call on, you know, to help you, you know, run an errand? Um, and then self-esteem or aff affirmational support, it helps you feel valued or respected. Um, so this, you know, can often be, you know, attained through, you know, work or volunteer, you know, opportunities um, or through your family, your familial, you know, responsibilities and connections. So thinking, do you have people in your life who make you feel really valued or respected, you know, in your life? And then belonging support. Um, it makes you feel like you're a part of something, you know, bigger, um, whether that's a community or professional organization, a religious group or your church, um, or your family or your neighborhood. Okay, so thinking, do you have a sense of, you know, belonging somewhere? Okay, so again, certainly given, you know, our current, you know, situation with the ongoing pandemic, it has been hard for people to identify, you know, uh, and reach out to their typical, you know, sources of support. Um, but, you know, for a number of these, you know, there are ways to, um, you know, connect with others virtually by phone, um, you know, or, or in safe social distanced, you know, situations. Um, but these are also just some suggestions to keep in mind when, you know, hopefully, the pandemic is, is behind us. Um, so visiting with friends and family, staying involved in the community, uh, volunteering for a cause that's meaningful to you, joining a group or club, um, writing letters or emails to people who you're close with or talking on the phone. Okay, so the next uh, factor is alcohol use. Um, so there has been, you know, evidence to suggest that light to moderate alcohol use may be related to a lower risk of dementia. But, you know, I think what I, what I think is, is key in this is understanding what is light use, what is moderate use. So for men, moderate drinking is no more than two drinks in a day. And for women, um, it's no more than one drink in a day. Um, the next question then is, what is a drink? Um, so... Um, a drink is 12 ounces of 5% beer, or it could be eight ounces of a 7% malt liquor, five ounces of 12% you know, wine, or one and a half ounces of 40% um, you know, spirits or liquor. So if, if you fill that beautiful glass of wine, um, you know, that may be more than five ounces, um, or if your friend makes you that you know, pint-sized cocktail, probably more than one and a half ounces. So keeping in mind, you know, what it is that you're actually consuming and thinking, okay, is this, how many drinks is this actually, not just the number of, you know, um, vessels <laughs> of alcohol that you're consuming in one sitting. Um, you know, and this is important because alcohol certainly does have impacts um, on, on our health, our, you know, general physical health and our brain health. So the short-term impacts include reduced alertness or reaction time, um, problems with coordination, balance, or risk of falls, and medication interactions. And then long-term, um, you know, alcohol, heavy alcohol use can contribute to liver damage, kidney disease, heart disease, some types of cancer, and then, of course, neurotoxic effects, you know, on the brain. And then with regard to, you know, tobacco and nicotine use, a lot of the research has focused on cigarette smoking, um, but there are a lot of different, you know, kinds of nicotine products out there. Um, you know, one point that I would just want to make is that, you know, nicotine travels throughout the body, and so it can have, you know, negative effects on multiple organs throughout the body. Um, smoking has been shown to increase, you know, oxidative stress and has effects on several 
vascular, inflammatory, and degenerative processes throughout the body. Um, now in the short term, nicotine may feel like it's helping you to concentrate or be less irritable, but ultimately in the long term, um, it makes it harder for the brain to regulate itself. Okay, so um, this contributes to you know emotional dysregulation and cognitive difficulties. You know, in addition to you know some of the other physical changes that I was talking about in different systems. Uh, so the, there are a lot of benefits, certainly, to quitting smoking, you know, like lowering the risk of heart attacks, um, stroke and lung disease, um, resulting in um, better blood circulation, and reducing risk of dementia, and then, of course, not exposing others to secondhand smoke as well. Okay, now certainly there are a lot of other substances out there. Um, that can have a negative impact on your brain health and just your overall physical health in general that I don't have time to go through in depth today. Um, but I think, you know, in general, when thinking about alcohol, tobacco, and other substances, um, really try to be honest with your medical providers about your use. Um, they can help you identify, you know, treatments and other strategies in order to, um, you know, minimize your use to a more, you know, healthy, level if you know for example in, in the case of alcohol or you know eliminating it altogether. Um, treatments often include medication, um, therapy or behavior strategies. Um, if there's you know concerns about physiologic dependence. So if there's um, if your body is really strongly addicted, for example in the case of alcohol, then detox may be necessary. And then also sobriety and support uh, programs like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous are, you know, some well-known examples of those kinds of programs. Okay, so, you know, I've gone through a lot of different things um, here today, and, you know, I think just in summary, I want to um, state that again, aging well, it depends on, you know, your genes and environment and lifestyle. And I was really trying to focus on lifestyle today. Um, lifestyle choices, you know, can help keep your body and your brain healthy. Um, and they are, you know, something that we have a little bit more control over and can modify, you know, based on our own individual needs um, and goals. So what I'd like to do next is um, just finish with a poll. I'd be curious to hear from you all, um, you know, before we go into the Q&A, um, which lifestyle factor or factors would you like to focus on based on your own needs? Okay, so thinking about your own life, what do you think would provide you, you know, the most benefit? Um, so I'd be curious to hear what people think. And you can select more than one choice. You've got about half of attendees responding. This is great. All right, we'll give just a couple more seconds, but it looks like. Um, most people are interested in incorporating more. I mean, well, a lot of them are are very close, with the exception of alcohol and substance use. Um, but the most popular is physical activity. Um, you know, certainly we are in, you know, in in the dead of winter as well, which makes physical activity probably that much harder. But physical activity and cognitive activity um, are the highest. Okay, followed by sleep and and mood or stress management. Okay. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, I think we can, I'll end the poll there. But thank you all for responding. You can share those results.
Okay, so cognitive activity was the, ended up being the most popular one. Okay. All right. Now on this final page here, I just wanted to provide um, you know some additional resources as well as you know some of the key references that I um, used in the talk. Um, so you know feel free to visit our website at the Meslum Center. Um, you know for some more information. Certainly the National Institute on Aging is a, an incredible um, source of information. And the Alzheimer's Association has um, a specific you know, page of brain health resources available. And then you know, um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has a national helpline that I just wanted to provide that you know, information uh, to you all as well um, for yourself or for loved ones, you know, should it be necessary. Um, but I think at this time, then, um, I would like to, you know, invite any questions that people have. Thank you, Dr. Daly, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I do have, we do have a few questions in the chat. Um, the first one is, Dr. Maureen, are waters like LaCroix or the sparkling types okay? Yes, um, great question. I'm a big fan myself. Um, <laughs> um, yes, because oftentimes those don't really have a lot of, you know, added sugars or, you know, just other additives to them. Um, so yes, um, I think, you know, uh, I have heard something about effects on just uh, dental hygiene, like if you have way too much but I think you'd have to have about like a, a case or so a day in order for it to have a problem with your teeth. So yes, as far as I, as far as my understanding, that would be absolutely fine. Right, and we have another question, how to increase physical activity if you have a physical disability or walking problems? Yeah, so that's a really excellent question. Um, you know, so first I, you know, I think I have to just give the caveat that, you know, speaking with your medical providers and, you know, even meeting with a physical therapist um, for specific um, recommendations on exercises that are safe for you and healthy for you, I think um, is a good place to start. Um, but, you know, in, in general, you know, thinking about, okay, so what is it that, that you can do, you know, so for example, um, again, this is limited right now, but swimming is often good for people who experience, you know, chronic pain or who have um, difficulties with walking, you know, so swimming can be a good one. Um, a stationary bike, like a recumbent stationary bike can also be a good form of exercise um, when there's difficulties with walking. But, you know, light stretches, you know, doing yoga and, you know, really light, you know, weightlifting or resistance bands can also help to just build strength and keep up mobility um, without, you know, risk of falls. Great. Um, another question is, if your doctor has you on a sleep medication, will that affect your chances of getting Alzheimer's? So that's a really excellent question. And um, again, sort of my caveat here is that you know, I'm not an MD, I'm a PhD, so I'm not a prescribing physician, um, but I would encourage you to speak with your you know, medical provider about any potential side effects of the medication that you're taking. Um, there is something that's called cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. Um, which is a kind of, um, of therapy where you would work with, you know, most likely a psychologist to work on, you know, sleep hygiene and any other, you know, kinds of behaviors that may be interfering with your quality of sleep. Um, so that may be an option that, you know, if you were to pursue, you know, you know, this kind of cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, then, you know, the goal would ultimately be to not have to be dependent on, you know, that sleep medicine. Okay, and back to the exercise, uh, there is a question about, does it have to be a recumbent bike or will any stationary bike work? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I said recumbent mostly because that, it, that seems to be the most safe um, setup. Um, you know, it, it, people who have, who have balance issues um, are most, tend to be most safe on a recumbent bike rather than something that they're leaning, you know, that they're high up on and leaning forward on. Um, but certainly if balance is not an issue and you feel comfortable on a more upright bike, then 
um, then that's that's excellent. That's great. And then um, another person wrote, um, if I can't find something that is right in front of me, what is going on? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question, and um, and you that is what us neuropsychologists are are you know thinking about all the time when we're working with different people, and so um, it's hard to know if you're having any you know changes in your thinking or if you're having any of these kinds of experiences. Um, you know, it can be difficult to know exactly what might be going on. So, you know, I'd wonder about you. Know, I want to make sure that your vision is okay. You know, are you paying attention to what you're doing and, you know, where you're placing things, um, you know, or is it more of just, or if, is, is it more of a, an issue with being able to process, you know, your visual environment? So, um, you know, it's, it's hard to know exactly what could be causing somebody to have difficulties, you know, seeing something that's in front of them, but I think bringing it to the attention of your doctor, um, you know, is, is, you know, could be warranted, especially if that's, you know, a new change for you. And this was, this is a related, why can't I remember something? And then it randomly pops into my head an hour later. Mm -hmm. um, another excellent question. Um, and so, so difficulties, you know, with memory or retrieving memories can occur for a lot of different reasons. Um, I will say that the fact that it comes back to you later is a good sign, um, you know, and that's certainly reassuring and we like to hear that um, because people can have difficulties retrieving that information for a lot of different reasons. It could be that you're just feeling tired or you're distracted or you're stressed out. And so those, um, those skills, those retrieval mechanisms, um, you know, aren't sort of operating at their full capacity. Um, you know, if, if somebody has longstanding difficulties with attention and with, um, you know, just retrieval in general, then, you know, certainly mood, stress and sleep can, you know, make those processes even harder. Um, but again, I think it's reassuring that it is coming back to you later. And so just trying to give yourself that time, you know, and, and even cueing yourself, you know, so trying to think about things that are related to what you're trying to retrieve. Um, you know, so sort of elaborating and talking about it out loud can help you to try to retrieve that information, um, trying to visualize what it is that you're trying to retrieve. You know, there are some different strategies you can, you know, try to implement to help, you know, get those memories out a little faster. Okay, and there is another question that just popped up. What about oversleeping? That's also a really good question. Um, so I guess it depends on how much oversleeping. Um, I mean, the recommendations are, you know, about seven to nine hours a night. Um, now, if you're feeling like your sleep need has increased um, and it's even beyond, you know, the nine hours, um, you know, it could be an indicator of, of, you know, some, you know, various different things. You know, you want to think about certainly what's been going on in your life. You know, are you feeling more stressed? Are you physically just more worn out? Um, are you not feeling well, you know, are you feeling a little sick? And so your body just needs that extra rest. Um, when there's excessive need for sleep, you know, um, also accompanied by low mood or sadness, um, or, you know, lack of motivation, that could be an indication of depression. Um, and, you know, then there also are, you know, certainly, you know, other medical, you know, causes or conditions that may contribute to excessive, you know, sleepiness. Now, if the quality of your sleep overnight is not very good, then that can also actually make people, you know, sleep for longer. So if your sleep is really frequently interrupted or it's just not of a good quality, then you may be in bed and feel like you're sleeping for longer, but it's not actually as restorative. So again, there could be a couple of different things going on, but sort of thinking about what other, if there's any other changes that have been associated with that increased sleep, you know, can be helpful in, in sort of figuring out what's going on. Great, that's helpful. Um, we also have a comment here that hearing hygiene is also an important part for cognitive health. So very yes. Yes. So that was one of those 12 modifiable factors that I didn't talk about today. But yes, hearing um, is, is also a big one. I mean, certainly if you're not 
able to hear what's going on. You're going to miss information. Um, it'll be harder to, you know, remember the in that information later. Um, it may also prevent you from being as socially engaged um, with others, you know, if you're having trouble, you know, maintaining, you know, conversation. So yes, um, maintaining good hearing health over time is also really important. Okay, and then this is a good question. I read that those online puzzles, puzzle websites that cost money are not good because your brain is used to answering them and it stops being a challenge. Is that true? Um, so very savvy. Um, yeah, so um, it's, so I think that the issue is really, you know, if you're doing different things, right? And so um, regardless of whether it's something that's computerized and something you pay for, or if it's something that you're doing in your day-to-day -day life, you know, if you're doing crosswords every day, you know, multiple hours a day, or you're spending a lot of time on the crossword, you're going to get very good at crosswords. But that doesn't necessarily generalize to other aspects of thinking. And so it's similar to, you know, these computerized, you know, brain train, brain training games, um, you know, that often do cost a lot of money that you may get really good at those games, but that doesn't necessarily generalize to improvements in your day to day functioning or other aspects of, you know, cognition. Um, so, again, sort of the the research at this point is most supportive of, you know, trying to do different things. So trying to engage in different cognitive activities, engage different parts of the brain in order to help sort of strengthen those, you know, mental, mental muscles, basically. Great. Thank you so much. Of course, my pleasure. So, um, so then I think who we have next is we have Brittany Muse. Um, hi, Brittany, who's going to share with you all a little bit more about, I'll stop sharing my screen, about the Mesalem Center and various research, you know, opportunities here. So I'm going to hand it over to Brittany. And thank you all so much. Hello, I am just going to figure out sharing my screen here. <laughs> uh, This will do it. Okay. I think you all can see my screen now, I'm hoping. <laughs> all right, so uh, hello. Um, my name is Brittany Muth, and I manage the clinical trials department here at the Mesoum Center. So I'm going to spend some time with you talking about research, what it is, and why it is important to participate. Okay. So let's first start by defining research and looking at how it differs from clinical care. So clinical care addresses the needs of individual patients. For example, if you are feeling sick, you might visit your primary care physician who would then ask you about your individual symptoms and provide care directly to you. Um, and this is kind of what Dr. Daly was um, talking about with if you're having personal concerns or specific concerns that you should visit your doctor and inquire about those. Now, research on the other hand is meant to address a question and not an individual. So research involves studying groups of people and may or, um, and may, or may not benefit an individual participant. For example, if we wanted to know what causes a certain illness, we would do a research study to answer that question. Research may involve new treatments or interventions that are not available clinically. So for example, if you're sick and you visit your doctor, they might only be able to prescribe a medication that is already approved, something that's already widely available and on the market. You know, you can kind of just go to the pharmacy and pick it up. Um, but research might be testing a new medication so that hopefully it can be approved later and available to the public. If you're participating in that research study, you might be randomly selected to receive a dummy medication or a placebo. And this would be the case um, where you might not receive an individual benefit from your participation, 
but your participation helps countless people later if that medication is uh, approved and we've answered our research question. Okay, so why participate? If you might not receive any individual benefit from research, What's the point in participating? Well, the information that we get from research is how we improve care in the future. The more we can learn about the risks or causes of a disease, the better we're able to then treat it. And the only way to get that new um, and better treatments approved is to first test them out and see how, how they do and how they perform, how well people tolerate them. So another reason it's important to participate is what we call generalizability. This means being able to apply what we've learned to a large group of people. Everyone is different, right? So the more people that we can get involved in research, the more differences we are able to study and the more we can be confident about applying those results to those larger groups. So for example, we don't want to test a medication on a small group of people that are mostly alike and then learn later on that that medication doesn't work well for another group of people. So it's important to get a large sample um, and it's important to get a mixed sample of people. So we really want to make sure that we're including people from all backgrounds, all different kinds of groups to make sure that the information that we're collecting will help us answer our research question at large. Okay. Um, so what are we studying here at the Mesalum Center, right? We have over 15 different studies here at the Mesalum Center, and we study a variety of things related to aging. We study a group of people called super agers. Uh, those are people who are aging really well and have above average memory and thinking for their age. We are also studying new treatments and interventions for dementia and Alzheimer's. And we have a number of studies looking at biomarkers to get more information on the risks of dementia and Alzheimer's and the aging process as a whole. Okay, so um, what can you expect in research, right? We have, um, you can expect that you're going to have research visits. Now the frequency and length of these visits is going to vary study to study. Again, like I said, we have over 15 different studies here at our center. So there are uh, certain differences or nuances between each study. But generally you can also expect um, that those research visits are going to have memory and thinking tests. Um, that you may have physical and neurological exams performed by one of our physicians, um, that you might have blood draws, um, brain scans, so we do MRI and PET scans so that we can get pictures of your brain and understand the physiology of, you know, the makeup of your brain and kind of relate that to the other data that we're collecting as well and brain donations. So this is optional, and this is something that we um, that is involved in some of our studies, and we do ask um, our participants if they would like to participate in this. But again, it's completely optional, and we walk you through that entire process of what that means and what information we collect and what we learn from brain donation. It can really be a very valuable source of information to help us answer our research questions here at our center. Okay. Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, I went back to the beginning. Okay. Um, here we are. Okay. How do we support you in research? So um, we realize that research sometimes can be asking a lot of our participants. There may be several uh, research visits, um, several scans, blood draws, and while research is always optional and always voluntary, um, we still want to make sure that we are supporting your participation in research. So some things that we do is we split visits where possible. We really try to accommodate 
your schedules. Um, you may have other people in your life that you're caring for. Um, you may be working or dependent on someone else who works. So we really try to make sure that we are um, arranging research visits to accommodate your schedule. Some visits may be very long um, in the way of maybe five hours or so. So where we can, we try to break that up. Maybe we do two hours on one day and the next week we do another two hours and maybe another day we do one hour. So we try to accommodate you as best as we can. Also, um, given the pandemic, we have also moved to doing virtual visits a lot. So when possible, we will also try to do your visits virtually. That may be over Zoom um, like this, or it may just be a telephone call. But we wanna make sure that we are, again, accommodating your schedule and making it easy for you. Maybe it's snowing really bad outside and you just don't wanna trek down to our sensor and that's fine. So if we can, we will try to do virtual visits. Um, you are compensated for your time and your effort when you're participating in a research study. Um, the compensation levels vary from study to study, uh, but there is compensation. Also for transportation, again, um, we do have lift programs for many of our studies. So if you are unable to arrange your own transportation to come down, or if you just think it would be easier, um, we can arrange for a lift ride that will pick you up from your home and bring you to our center and bring you back. Um, so that's another thing that we do. We also offer free parking. So if you are um, driving your own vehicle to our center, your parking will be covered and there's transportation reimbursement as well. So maybe you don't wanna take the lift and you're not driving, but you're just gonna take the train um, or the bus, there is compensation uh, for that as well to help with reimbursing those expenses. Let's try not to skip ahead. Okay, so now I'm going to play for you um, a video of a participant in one of our research studies here, and she kind of explains her experience um, with participating in research. So this is about a four minute video. Let me just cue this up and see if we can get it playing. Sorry guys, give me one second here. Chicago, there's a rare group of seniors who not only avoid the diseases of old age, they maintain the brain power of someone more than half their age. Now each of them is giving a gift that could someday unlock the mysteries of growing old. I'm gonna make a butterscotch marshmallow cookie. When 104-year-old Edith Renfro Smith makes cookies, nothing's written down. So where's your recipe? <laughs> Mixed in are vivid stories of an amazing life. The first time she heard a radio. It was a very exciting time. Or she that time she room. met Amelia Earhart. You felt like you really knew her. How could she disappear? Born in 1914, the same year World War I broke out, Edith's lived through 18 U.S. presidents and is still sharp as a tack. You've never struggled with your memory? Oh, no. Oh no. How do you feel I at feel 104? Great. I feel great. Edith is a member of an elite group of seniors called Super Agers. These are individuals who are over age 80 and have memory performance at least as good as individuals in their 50s and 60s. Question is, how did they do this? It's a mystery Emily Rogalski and researchers at Chicago's Northwestern University are trying to solve by gathering the largest group of Super Agers in the world. But to be invited in, you can't just be old, you must pass a test with 15 words. And they have to remember at least nine of them. Out of the 15. Out of the 15. To make it even harder, we even give them a distractor list in between. And then we ask them about that first list again. And some of them can remember all 15. 
so that's even more impressive. But it's what the superagers agree to do in the end that's really helping researchers. Each will donate his or her brain. This is one of the really important parts of the study is that people actually have given that ultimate gift of donating their brain at the time of death. Inside those brains, a treasure trove of new understanding. The red and yellow you see, it represents the thinning in a normal 80-year-old brain. When we look at the superager brains, we see something that's dramatically different. Now there's no red and yellow. Oh. This was pretty shocking. Blue actually means that the superagers had a thicker cortex. This region is important for attention, right. and um, attention supports memory. Also inside, an abundance of a neuron once thought to be only in the brains of elephants and whales. We were shocked to see the fact that there was this abundance of von Economo neurons. Von Econa? Von Economo neurons. There's actually about five times the number of von Economo neurons in the superager brain compared to average agers. No. But there's something else Edith and other superagers all have in common, and you don't need a microscope to see it a positive attitude. So, no complaining, no worrying. No, you can't complain. She still reads four books a week, and the most stress you'll see from her, when she forgets those cookies are in the oven. You had to agree to donate your brain at the end. Oh, yes, yeah. oh, yeah. They can't study your brain unless they get it. So unless they have my brain, they can't look at all, what all those little squiggle squiggles they got in. <laughs> I think we're going to learn a lot from your brain. I hope so. I hope so. And if it helps somebody, think how much that would, it means to that individual if they get help. What's exciting about this, I think mm -hmm. all the people in this are really excited because they feel they're doing a public service of sorts. They're donating their brains and they have this positive attitude about growing old, about their uh, ability to give this gift to the rest of us so we can learn about how to grow old and be a super ager, which is what we all want to be. It's like unlocking the secrets. It right. may be right there. I think that's what's exciting in all of these studies is people want to know what are the secrets yeah. and we can only learn if people actually participate in these kinds of trials. All right, Maria, thank you so much. Thank So how do you get involved with research here at the Meslam Center? Well, the first step is to join our research recruitment registry. And to join the registry, you will take a simple online survey to answer some questions about yourself and your interests. Once we receive your survey results, we will review them and contact you if you have been matched to a study. Again, we have over 15 different studies here at the Muslim Center. So whether you have memory concerns or not, or if you have a diagnosis or not, we are interested in talking to you. Most of our studies are looking for people that are age 55 and up. However, some studies are looking for individuals as young as 40, and our super agers just need to be at least 80 years old. So we have pretty much something for everyone. So if you're interested in participating in research in any capacity, please um, join our registry and know that joining our registry does not commit you to participating in any study. It's just so that we can see, um, you know, so that we can match you to a study and we'll contact you and explain that study to you and answer any questions you might have um, prior to, you know, you actually signing up for and participating in the study. Um.